Hey, Internet. Fuzzy, fuzzy, cute, cute, fuzzy, fuzzy, cute, cute, fuzzy, fuzzy, cute, cute, fuzzy, fuzzy, cute, more fuzzy. Welcome to Rovio Everlasting, your favorite YouTube addiction. Yeah, you keep on dancing on that cell phone. And yeah, I don't know what to say other than it's time for This episode of Worldview Everlasting is brought to you by the letter awesome, the numbers sweet action, and issues etc. Talk radio for the thinking Christian. Issues etc. So, we are in Advent, the season of coming, the season of preparation, the season of judgment. I know that's kind of weird. We like to think it's like pre-Christmas, so it's all happy time right now. But, I mean, if you heard me preach this past week and you know, I mean, it's, it's like this kind of tension between the knowledge that Christ came to save us and was born in Bethlehem, incarnated in our flesh and all the joy to the world stuff, and yet the reality of what that cross that he was born to die on means, especially in terms of his having ascended into heaven and still coming again to judge the living and the dead. And so we've had in the book of Luke this year, series C for the lectionary, a real emphasis on John the Baptist and the coming judgment. I mean, it's been some hard stuff. Today, we're going to get a little bit more of that, including some from Jesus himself. Although at the same time, I think if you see the text correctly in his context, you're going to find there's a lot of power, potent, packed, absolute gospel stuff in this text that can really just kind of preach this thing out of the park. So it's definitely worth being excited about what we got on draft for you here today. That's a liquor reference. Liquor reference. He's talking about liquor. We're officially looking at Luke chapter 7 verses 18 to 35, a big chunk. Some congregations will actually have a smaller chunk, just the front half. But really to get the whole picture, you're going to have to have it in its context as well. We'll do that more towards the end. But things have progressed quite a bit since we last saw John the Baptist last week preaching by the Jordan River. Now Jesus has come onto the scene. He's done things like preach the Beatitudes, which in Luke's gospel is even less about morality than it is in Matthew's gospel. I mean, you could maybe make the argument in Matthew's gospel that the Beatitudes are law. It gets a little bit more difficult to do that in Luke's gospel because how is it a law to be poor hmm? even if it's poor in spirit but it's like impoverished blessed are the hungry blessed are the weeping blessed are people who are hated I mean those those aren't laws you can keep right so Jesus has preached those beatitudes he's preached the woes as well where he has condemned uh, well a whole host of stuff the satisfied the satiated the laughing slash scoffing and those who have all men speak well of them so he's preached these things he's also been doing quite a number of miracles especially then directly before our text today, Jesus has just capped off his string of miracles, which we began with healing and casting out demons by doing something really totally crazy, pretty much unbelievable, raising a dead boy, right? A guy who was the son of a widow who had died, who was being carried out in funeral procession. I mean, this is no kind of like swoon kind of thing. Jesus walks into the midst of this huge crowd in funeral procession and he puts his hand on the kid and says, get up. And the kid goes, right? I have conjuration sickness. Ooh, hat tip to the spatula of RPG purity there for you who are paying attention. Anyway, he wakes up, right? Jesus has just raised the dead. It's at this point then that some of the disciples of John, those who have been following him out by the Jordan River, go to him and report what's going on. And then John does something a little interesting, something that, well, leads even good Lutheran pastors to disagree with each other about what it might mean. John calls two of his disciples, you assume they're people he trusts, and he sends them, he pempos them, not the apostle word, but just the regular sending word. He sends them to the Lord, saying, Are you Ha Erkamas, the coming one? Right? You can translate it as the one who is to come, but it's like bigger than that. It's the adventing one, the one we are waiting for, right? The coming one. Are you him? Are you the Messiah? Or, yes, should we expect another? Should we wait for another? Look for another to come? So the question is, why is John asking this? Is John having a moment of doubt, a human moment, a sinful moment? He had preached that the reign of God, the actual appearance of the kingdom and the final judgment was about to happen, and he had baptized Jesus, believing him to be the one, for in fact, he saw the spirit descend out of heaven and arrest on him, and he's proclaiming to everybody, that's the guy right there, follow him. And yet now he's sitting in prison under Herod, having not been released, and being threatened with death, in fact, he's gonna die pretty soon, and Jesus is out there preaching, and he's hearing about the miracles, but where's, where's the reign of God on earth? Well, where is the kingdom? Why are the bad people still winning? 
Yeah. Or is John just trying to teach his disciples who are still following him that they need to go listen to Jesus? Now that would be, I think, if I'm not mistaken, what Luther actually says. I disagree with Luther. I think this is a great illustration of the humanity of John the Baptist, how even the greatest man born of woman still has doubts, and that kind of plays into what's going to come later, but it's not key to the entire passage, I don't think. It's something you could focus on, but it's not the main thrust of what's going on. But it does, and it can, connect to the idea that the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. That is, anyone with any faith at all, being both saint and sinner, is greater than John is by himself of his own making faith, because even he must rely on the grace of God to cover his own shortcomings. Yeah? Either way, in the same hour that these men from John come to Jesus, Jesus has been kind of busy. He's been healing many people. Etherapusin polus. You can hear in that word therapy. He's been bringing therapy, but like truly healing therapy to polus, the many, the multitudes, right? This ain't no moralistic therapeutic deism. I mean, this is like, well, it's going to say next, healing them of actual diseases and casting out evil spirits. And on many who are blind, he is gracing them. And the word there is actually based on the word charis, grace, gift. He is gifting them with sight. Mm. I mean, yeah, as you know, we sit here, we're like, oh, maybe it's all just like a story about how great he is and it didn't really happen. It's all kind of symbolic about how Jesus just taught people to love. But see, that's just not what the text says at all. I mean, here's this guy literally doing the impossible, miraculously healing people. I mean, he's not cutting open their wounds and putting some leeches inside, right? He is actually speaking words that are causing the blind to see again. Whoa, crazy stuff. And so he answers the disciples of John. And notice he says, go and tell John. Make sure that John hears this. This isn't just for you too, but I preach to John here. What do you see and hear? And he quotes Isaiah chapter 29 here as if to kind of drive home the point directly that what was prophesied of old is actually taking place right now. And he can just quote it and be like, do you add them together? Make the connection two plus two equals four, yeah? And the English isn't so great here, at least as far as I'm reading the Greek. It's not the blind receive their sight. There's a little more poetry to this. You know, the ESV kind of botches it on this one. It's beautiful stuff. The blind see, the lame walk, the leprous are clean, the deaf hear, dead are raised. And that one, you as the reader know, just happened. And then he shifts it. And with the last thing, you would think he would end with the peak of the mountain, right? The dead are raised, but he's got one more to say. The poor have the good news preached to them. Again, I'm afraid English fails us. Okay, it's the same word poor that a few chapters back he hit with the first beatitude, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Interesting. It's the word patakos, which can mean poor, but also very often does in fact mean just incapable of sustaining yourself, totally reliant on others. That is the weak, the helpless. At times, the reference is not only to unfavorable circumstances of these people from an economic point of view, the thought is that since they are oppressed and disillusioned, they are in special need of God's help and may be expected to receive it shortly. Or lacking in spiritual worth. Mm. Sinners? Yeah. Being extremely inferior in quality. Those who are extremely inferior in quality have the good news preached to them. One word in the Greek, euangelizontai. That is, they are gospelized, right? They are victoriousnesses. The victory is placed upon them. Those who are worthless are brought to total overcoming victory of what? Mm. Health, wealth, and wellness? Not now. Because what happens next? Yeah? Catch the connection. He ends with the first Beatitudes reference. The poor are gospelized. And the next verse, verse 23, and makareoi. Blessed. Mm. Beatitudinized is the one who is not scandaliste, scandalized, offended, tripping over me, Jesus. So you actually kind of have a bookend to the opening of the Beatitudes, and certainly it's going to continue on. But if you take the pericopes between the Sermon on the Plain and this little speaking section here, there's only three stories in the middle. The healing of a centurion's son, the question of John the Baptist, and smack down in the middle, the resurrection of a son from the dead. Hmm. Don't you love it when that happens? I mean, it's almost like the guy planned it when you wrote it this way. It's kind of nuts. You know, we all know they were idiots who were just scribbling down mythology as they made it up. But wow, you, you could almost think it's intentionally like knowing what's going on and confessing that Jesus risen from the dead is kind of key. To everything. Hmm? So moving on from this section then, Jesus goes into another kind of, well, Sermon on the Plain, although it's not the Sermon on the Plain, it's the Sermon where they are, outside of Nain, maybe, or something. John's disciples have gone away back to John with this fulfillment of Isaiah being basically preached to them. You know, John says, are you the one? He says, well, what's Isaiah say? Do you see it happening? I'll put two and two together. And blessed is the one who believes that I'm fulfilling all these things, who doesn't like run into me and say, no, not Jesus, he can't be the son of God, right? But actually just receives this reality, which is 
Jesus' work and the Spirit's work to redeem you, right? Yeah? After this, Jesus then speaks to the crowds concerning John, and this is some fun stuff right here. Hey, you people. So, yeah, tell me. Yo, what did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? I don't know what's up with the rocky thing or where that came from, but the point being, this is like not like happy talk here. It's like, seriously, people, what did you go out to see? Some little shaky little thing in the wind, blown about every which way, has no ability to stand on its own, a little entertainment maybe? Then he ups the ante a little more. So what did you go out to see then? Hmm? A man dressed in soft clothing? And I love how our Victorian piety makes us translate that word soft. And it, the word can mean soft, that is the primary meaning, but it has another meaning as well. The word is malakos, and it can pertain to the passive partner in same-sex relationships, sometimes translated as effeminate when referring to a male. So a nice translation would be, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in effeminate woman's clothing? Go a little deeper, what did you go out to see? A, um... Well, I'll let you put the two and two together right there, huh? Now, to be sure, it's connected to clothing. A man dressed up with all the frills and plays and, uh, you know, you know, I mean, it's a caricature, but, you know, compared to a reed shaken by the wind. Something entertaining, something to laugh at, something that's a spectacle, something that can't be relied upon. Jesus says, behold, those who are dressed in soft clothing and who live in luxury, which, again, that word there, also the pious translation, those dressed in flamboyant clothing and who live in trufe, revelry. Mm -hmm. They are hupacontes. Can mean exist, can also mean at the discretion of. At the discretion of what? Kings. The word houses isn't in the Greek. They are simply the things that kings get to play with. Hmm, fascinating that one. So what'd you go out to see? Some weed shaking around or some guy dressed in woman's clothing? Come on. Those things are what people who live in licentiousness and revelry deal with. What did you go out to that wilderness to see? A prophet? Oh, yes. And I will tell you much more than a prophet because this is the one of whom old prophecy pointed to that he would be the last one to come before the final king shows up. Even he of whom it is written, I will send my messenger before you to prepare your way for you. And you can kind of imagine Jesus saying at that point, that's but he goes on to talk about, John, I say to you, of those born from woman, none has arisen greater than John the Baptist. And what's the point of me telling you this? So that you can know that the very least, the very weakest, the very worst in the kingdom of heaven, the poorest of the poorest of the poor, spiritually worthless, is greater than he. Now, I don't think it's just an irony that the very next story in Luke's gospel is when he goes into a Pharisee's house and as a prostitute start washing his feet. Hmm. Remember that one? There were two people who had two debts. One was great, one was small. Tell me, who will love the one that forgives the debt? But before he gets there, we got a little bit more in our actual text. A little kind of parenthetical aside about how the people received this preaching. They were glad that he was like lifting up John and all this. But Jesus doesn't seem to like be so happy with their, we were baptized by John, we got it right. And those other people didn't, those Pharisees, you know. So he says, so what am I going to compare you to? This entire generation, which you can take to mean those living then, you can take it to mean the entire world, you can take it to mean humanity, right? Doesn't really matter. It's kind of all those things. What can I compare you to, you sinners who don't believe in me, who don't receive me, who are scandalized because of the things I say and do? Like a bunch of spoiled kids sitting there complaining about everything their parents do for them. Yeah, you know the ones. And so they say, we played the flute and you didn't dance. We played a dirge and you didn't mourn. John the Baptist came eating no bread and drinking no wine and you said he was a man with a demon. The son of man that is the Messiah, the king, the one who'll sit on David's throne comes both eating and and drinking, that would be wine. Liquor reference number two, get him out of here. Get the kids in the car. Because you say he is a glutton and a drunk. Doesn't matter what we do, what prophets look like, how they act, whether they dress in effeminate clothing or camel's hair, those who refuse to believe it are going to refuse to believe it because that's their will, their choice, their decision, their lack of faith. But I'm going to say to you, Jesus says to close it out, wisdom is justified by her children. Now, this is not a question of justification by grace versus justification by works. This is Jesus claiming that his own actions will prove their own value, just as claims of a human about how they ought to raise kids will bear out its fruit in how those kids end up being raised, yeah? So also his claims about being the Messiah and John's claims about him being the Messiah will be proven by the results of what they do. Hey, there we are again, looking at this whole resurrection of the dead thing. Wisdom, Jesus, justified by his children, meaning his resurrection from the dead, proving who he is and what he's done, which happens to just turn around and justify his children, namely you, yeah? <laughs> Did I tell you we had a lot on draft for you today? Liquor reference number three, that is enough! I am tired of this! I mean, you gotta let this stuff 
ferment in your head. It's an ocean of liquor and he's Poseidon. Get in the car, kids. And just percolate. There is so much here, so much good gospelizing, euangelianizing of you out there in internet land. Wow. Oh. Good stuff, and we're definitely out of time. Long show today. But uh, hey, Lutheran Ninja Clan is going great. Keep plugging away and joining on. If you haven't already, five bucks a month, you can help make this show all the much better. Give me the energy I need by letting me give off some of these tasks to the good man Peter, the ninja helper monkey guy thing because it's huge. I can't even express just having Peter on board for a week what a difference it's made in my own work schedule and how much more time it gives me to do things like get into the Greek and give you a few more Greek words today. Yeah? Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, we'll catch you on Friday with a special Christmas episode for 2013. That is if the world doesn't end. When is the world supposed to end? I'm going to look that up. December 21st, which is breaking news. The end of the world won't happen before our Christmas special. Catch you next time. Rock on. Rock on.